This lecture begins Phys 8 Slides 13.pdf in the files area. Phys 8 Slides 13.pdf has absolutely nothing to do with Missouri's chapter 13, which we will not cover in this course. The next Missouri chapter that we will cover is chapter 15 during the last week of the term. So this set of slides draws from several chapters. Giancoli chapter 9 on statics and elasticity. Onuye Kane chapter 2 on statics, which is a pretty cool review of forces. And Onuye Kane chapter 3, which you'll find pretty tricky. We're only going to go through part of that chapter. It covers analysis of trusses and so on. Onuye and Kane do a really nice job analyzing trusses. And again, the book is so beautifully illustrated in the hand-drawn nature of old-fashioned architectural drawing. Pages 12 through 16 of my equation sheet, which is something like 40 pages long, covers what we cover in these slides and covers everything that you might possibly want to know from these three chapters. But for your convenience, I pasted all of that content into the next several slides. Here's where we left off last time. We had a sign of known mass suspended between two cables, and the two cables are at slightly different angles. So this tension points in this direction along this cable, and this tension points in this direction along this cable. So the tensions are what we call axial forces. The tension can only point along the axis of the cable. And then we have a point here where T1, T2, and the short segment holding up the sign all meet. So this makes an excellent segue into our discussion of trusses. So this point we will call a joint. And then these things that are cables in this context, which can be in tension but not in compression, will become bars in our trusses. And a bar of a truss can be either in tension or in compression, but like a cable, it can only support an axial force. It cannot support a force perpendicular to the axis of the bar. So the way we analyzed the forces at this point, which sometimes we labeled P, we said, let's write the equilibrium equations for this point P. And there was no torque equation because all of the forces pass through this one point. So if we use this point as the pivot, there would be everything, every torque would be zero. So the torque equation tells us nothing in this case. But we summed all the forces horizontally to zero, and we summed all the forces vertically to zero acting on this point P. So when we analyze a truss, this point P will be an example of what we call a joint in a truss, and these tensions will be examples of what we call bar forces in a truss. So they can be either tension or compression in a truss. And then we could look at this sign or the weight of this sign as a load that the truss has to support. So we will see when we analyze a truss that we are usually given some set of externally imposed forces that it is the truss's job to support. So those are called the loads. In this case, there were also a couple of external hinge supports drawn. We'll do something similar when we see trusses. Let's move on to our first truss. Slide 15 shows an image of this truss, which I've redrawn on the board here. And it asks, how many equations does the method of joints allow us to write down for this truss? So we want to consider how many joints the truss has. Well, you don't know yet what the method of joints is, so let's discuss that. So these points, A, B, C, and D, which I've emphasized in magenta, are joints. So this truss has one, two, three, four joints. So the big dots in magenta are joints, and then the Line segments in orange are bars or members, so let's call them bars. So we have one, two, three, four, five bars. We have one, two, three, four joints. You remember back in the previous problem where we had several cables intersecting at a point that we were able to write the two equilibrium equations, sum of forces in x equals zero and sum of forces in y equals zero for that one point. So the method of joints for a truss says for each joint you can write the sum of forces in x equals zero and the sum of forces in y equals zero. The method of joints, which we will practice momentarily 
tells us for each joint, let's call it the joint J. So for each joint J, you can write that the sum of the forces in the X direction acting on joint J equals zero, and the sum of the forces in the Y direction acting on joint J equals zero. So if you have some number of joints, then you get two times that number of joints for the number of equations you can write down. Essentially, we are saying that if this truss as a whole is in equilibrium, it's not accelerating, it's not accelerating rotationally, then every joint of the truss is also in equilibrium. So you would think that would give us three equations per joint, but because all of the forces acting at a given joint have lines of action that pass through that joint, there is no new information to be gained from a torque equation for a joint, so we only get two equations per joint. We will see that it is possible to write a torque equation sometimes, in many cases, for the truss as a whole, which lets us solve for the reaction forces that externally support the truss on the ground. So how many equations does the method of joints allow us to write down for this truss? Well, we have one, two, three, four joints, so we must have two times four is eight equations we can write down. So I like answer B, we can write down eight equations. Now you might ask why, what's the point of working with trusses? Well, the equilibrium equations are the aspect of mechanics of this physics course that are most pertinent to architecture, to asking how do things stand up? How do we study the forces that hold a structure in place? And a truss not only is a ubiquitous object in the real world. For example, if you walk past a railroad bridge, you'll see trusses. If you look at the roof construction of a wood-framed house, you'll see a pattern of rafters and collar ties and joists that either appears to be or sometimes explicitly is a system of trusses. And analyzing trusses can give us insight into how big a given force has to be depending on the dimensions, how far apart things are, what shape things take. So trusses have a kind of simple formulaic method of analysis and we can gain some insights from analyzing trusses that will later help us to understand other things like beams and so on. Next, how many unknown internal forces, in other words, internal tensions or compressions, do we need to determine when we solve this truss? Solving a truss usually involves determining the size and sign, in other words, whether it's tension or compression, of every bar force. So for every bar in the truss, you need to determine how big is the tension or compression in that bar and whether it is a tension or compression. These are all internal forces within the truss. So if you think of the truss as an object, as a whole, then the bar forces are internal forces, whereas these forces exerted by the ground, for example, and the loads that are applied are external forces. So we have one, two, three, for five bars, so that means we have five unknown internal forces, five unknown bar forces, bar AB, BC, CD, AD, and BD. Five unknown bar forces to solve for. So I think I like answer B. We have five unknown internal forces, those are bar forces, to determine when we solve this truss. There will also be some reaction forces we have to solve for. We have to figure out what the ground has to do to the truss to keep it in equilibrium. This is a simply supported truss. That means it has a roller support on one far end and it has a pin or hinge support on the other far end. How many independent reaction forces do the two supports exert on the truss? If there are independent horizontal and vertical components, count them as separate forces. The pin support at A can exert both a vertical force and a horizontal force on the truss. The roller support, this is just like a little roller skate. The roller support at C can exert a vertical force, but not a horizontal force. So we have one force here, which is vertical on the truss, basically from the ground. And we have two forces here on the truss from the ground, a vertical force and a horizontal force. So that would be three reaction forces. So I like answer B, that there are three reaction forces that the two supports exert on the truss. Notice that eight equals five plus three. We have eight equations available 
we have five unknown bar forces, and we have three unknown reaction forces. Two, four, six, eight equations we can write down for some of the forces in X and some of the forces in Y at each of the four joints. We have one, two, three, four, five unknown bar forces, and then we have one, two, three, unknown reaction forces. That's good. We have exactly the same number of unknowns as we have equations to determine unknowns. So for a planar truss that is stable and that is capable of being solved using the equations for static equilibrium, a necessary condition is two times the number of joints equals the number of bars plus three. If this is not true, then you cannot solve the truss using the methods of static equilibrium in a plane. If it is true, then you probably can, but not necessarily. There are some trusses that have the correct relationship between the number of joints and the number of bars that are still not solvable with the equilibrium equations. But every solvable truss has this property. Two times the number of joints equals the number of bars plus three. So it is a necessary condition. You get two force equations per joint. That's what the left side says. And you need to solve for one unknown tension or compression per bar. And then we also need to solve for three support forces, which are also known as reaction forces in the lingo. What do we learn by writing the three, we actually get three equilibrium equations for the truss as a whole. And let's use joint A as our pivot. Well, there are three possible answers here. I guess one of them is correct, but let's just try working out the answer for ourselves. So using A as the pivot. Well, the nice thing about using A as the pivot is that we can directly write down an expression that will give us the one unknown force at joint C, because the two unknown support forces at A will have zero lever arm when we pivot about A. Let's replace on our diagram this pin support with two arrows. I'm going to call this R a y and i'm going to call this r a x and then at this roller support i'm going to erase that and call this r c y so treating the truss as a whole the external forces are r a x r a y r c y this one kilonewton load acting on the truss at b to the right and this two kilonewton load acting on the truss at D downward. Why do I say kilonewton? We've been used to using newtons, but you know, a truss is supposed to hold things that are kind of more like tons than pounds. To get the scale more like the ton scale, we want to use kilonewtons. That means thousands of newtons instead of newtons. So if we start with the torque equation, the sum of the torques about A, this is for the truss as a whole, so we only care about external forces. Well, Counterclockwise, we have R, C, Y. That's a vertical force. We want the horizontal distance from the pivot. The horizontal distance from the pivot is four meters. We have two meters here, two meters here, so that distance is four meters. The forces, the external forces at B and at D both go clockwise, so that's a minus sign. So we have minus one kilonewton. That's a vert that's a horizontal force. We want the vertical distance. The vertical distance from here up to this line of action, you see, if we were to extend this line of action, then its vertical distance to the pivot is one meter. So that's one meter. And then minus two kilonewtons. That's a vertical force. The relevant distance is two meters. By the way, how do I know which ones are clockwise and which ones are counterclockwise? Well, if I just put my thumb, if I use my mind's eye and I put my thumb at point A and I say, okay, let me exert a force at point C in the direction of R, C, Y. Well, that would tend to make the whole truss rotate counterclockwise. See, I'm leaving the pivot fixed and I'm pushing in the direction of the force who's, that I want to turn into a torque. So if I push in the direction of RCY at point C while leaving my pivot fixed, then the whole truss moves counterclockwise. So that's a positive torque, a positive moment. If instead I keep the pivot fixed and I push or pull in the direction of the external force at D, that's downward, that moves the truss as a whole clockwise. So that is a negative moment, a negative torque. And then I could do the same thing at B. 
I leave point A fixed in place and I pull in the direction. This is a little bit harder to see because it's kind of a shorter lever arm, but if I pull in that direction of B, maybe it's easier to see this way. See, I pull, I leave this pivot fixed and I pull in that direction. It is a clockwise motion. So this is clockwise. This is clockwise. This is clockwise. This at C is counterclockwise. Everything here is known except for RCY. I can isolate the term that contains RCY, our one unknown. Everything else is a given. So let's leave RCY on the left and move this other stuff to the right. RCY times four meters equals, well, here's one times one and then plus two times two. So that's five kilonewton meters. One times one plus two times two. So that's one plus four is five. That gives me RCY equals plus five fourths. So that's 1.25 kilonewton. Next, we can ask, what do we get by writing the forces in X equals zero? You see, I did the torque equation first because I knew that it was going to give me an equation and having only one unknown. And then you don't have to worry about substituting and eliminating with multiple unknowns in one equation. Now we can say zero is the sum of the forces in X on the truss as a whole. The reaction force at A in the X direction is to the right. We're going to do right minus left, and we're only treating external forces. The reaction forces in light blue and the loads in orange are, reaction, are external forces. Then we have plus one kilonewton. Oh, we can see I drew the arrow the wrong direction for RAX because we're going to get a negative answer. So this will tell us that RAX equals minus one kilonewton. So it's minus a thousand newtons. So I could just leave the arrow pointing to the right as it does and say it's just a negative number, or I could redraw it pointing to the left, which might be more legible then, and use a positive number. Anyway, that seems to be my answer for RA. X, and that seems to be the equation I get for the forces in X. Then I can say zero is the sum of the forces in the Y direction on the truss as a whole. So I'm going to do up minus down. So we'll say RAY plus RCY minus two kilonewton. And then we actually already know what RCY is. The only thing we need to solve for here is RAY. That gives us RAY equals two kilonewtons minus RCY, which is two kilonewtons minus 1.25, let's say five fourths kilonewtons. So RAY must be three quarters, right? Two minus one and a quarter is three quarters. So that's plus three quarters of a kilonewton equals plus 0.75 kilonewtons. So which one of these sets of equations do we like? For the forces in Y, we got RAY plus RCY minus two kilonewtons equals zero. That looks like it agrees with A, it agrees with B, it agrees with C. Okay, so we're not going to get any information about which answer we like from that. In X, we had RAX plus one kilonewton equals zero. Seems like they all say that. The only one that differs, I guess they only differ in the torque equation. Minus two kilonewtons times two meters, minus one kilonewton times one meter, plus RCY times two meter. No, that's no good. Minus two times two, minus one times one, plus RCY times four meters equals zero. I think I like B. And then let's see if we can rule this out. Minus two kilonewtons, two meters, minus one kilonewton. No, no, I don't like this two meters. See, the one kilonewton force has a one meter, not a two meter lever arm, because it's a horizontal force, so we want the vertical displacement. So the horizontal displacement is two meters to that two kilonewton force up here, but we want the vertical displacement, not the horizontal displacement from the pivot. So it should be one. So I think I like B. So we'll go with B. Bravo, and that seems to agree with the answers we just worked out. Well, at least the equations we wrote down. Next, we want to ask, what two equations does the method of joints let us write down for joint C? Well, why joint C? Well, you almost always want to pick a joint where there are at most two unknown forces. If you can pick one where there is only one unknown force, so much the better. You know you'll get two equations from that joint. And it's nice if you can resolve them right away rather than writing down some big system that you later have to solve using substitution. So sometimes you can just go around alphabetically 
or in some arbitrary order, but that can leave you with a system of equations that is tedious to solve. So by being a little bit clever about starting from places where there's only one or only two unknowns, you can make life a little easier. So let's say, what can we write at joint C? Just peeking ahead a little bit, it seems as if there are two bar forces that have horizontal components, but only one has a vertical component. So I think actually the sum of forces in Y is going to be the quickest route to simple equations, especially since we already solved for the reaction force at Y. You don't always have to solve in advance for the reaction forces. Sometimes you can just write down the eight joint equations and you're good. It often turns out to be less tedious to do the math if you solve for the three reaction forces first. And every once in a while you'll find a truss that really requires you to do the three reaction forces first. Okay, so at joint C, zero equals the sum of the forces in Y on C. So up minus down is things acting on joint C. So we have RCY is up, and we also have some portion of TBC. See, we are initially assuming that everything is in tension, and if it turns out to be in compression, we will get a minus sign. So just treat it as if it were a cable in tension. Then we can write T, the capital letter T, for each bar force, and if it's negative, that turns out to be compression. So this will be plus because it's up. It's up because if this thing is in tension, bar BC, then it is pulling this way kind of northwest, so up and to the left, on joint C. So it seems to be the tension, assumed to be tension, BC times the sine of this angle theta, which we have not written down. For this triangle, it's a 1, 2, root 5 triangle. The hypotenuse is root 5, the vertical is 1, the horizontal is 2. So for this angle theta, cosine theta, is 2 over root 5, and sine theta is 1 over root 5. It may turn out to be easier to plug in numbers, but let's leave it as sine theta for now, and we can just be aware that if we want to substitute, we can. So this equation will let us solve directly for TBC, because we know what sine theta is, and we know what RCY is from our previous steps. So that's good. So TBC seems to be minus RCY over sine theta, which seems to be minus root 5 times 5 fourths kilonewton. Then we can do the sum of forces in the x direction, right minus left, acting on joint C. So to the right, we have nothing. So to the left, we have all of TCD. So you see TCD, if this is in tension, then it's pulling joint C to the left, and it's pulling joint D to the right. If you imagine a rope with tension. C gets pulled left, D gets pulled right. And then TBC, we have TBC times cosine theta, and that's to the left, minus TBC cosine theta. So that tells us, that we already know TBC from this previous step, so that tells us that TCD is minus TBC cosine theta. So I guess the root fives will cancel and we'll get a factor of two somehow. We have this cosine and sine together. Let's see how this agrees with our candidate answers. TCD minus TBC cosine theta equals zero. I don't like that because we need a minus sign for both. Well, okay, so I guess here's a plus sign. So TCD plus TBC cosine theta equals zero. I would have written both terms with minus signs, but okay, this seems okay. So C seems okay, Charlie. And then RCY plus TBC sine theta equals zero. So I think I like answer C here, Charlie. TCD plus TBC cosine theta equals zero. I wrote it with minus signs over here because I prefer to say right minus left. And then RCY plus TBC sine theta equals zero. So yeah, I think I like answer C, Charlie. So working out numbers, TBC turns out to be minus 2.8 kilonewtons. I think it's actually minus 2.7 so we'll round it just a tiny bit. And TCD works out to be plus 2.5 kilonewtons, which is exact. Next, what two equations does the method of joints let us write down for joint A? So joint A seems like a good choice because we already have solved for this reaction force and this reaction force, so we have only two unknown bar forces here, and 
looking ahead a little bit, there's only one with a vertical component. So when we write the sum of the forces in y equals zero, we will directly solve for TAB, and then we'll get another equation in x, which lets us directly solve for TAD. So let's do that. Let's start with the sum of the forces in y equals zero for joint A, and then we'll say the sum of the forces in x acting on joint A equals zero. Okay, so zero is the sum of the forces in the y direction, up minus down, acting on joint A. So we have R, A, Y, so this is acting upwards on joint A, and then we have plus P, A, B, sine theta, and I think that is it. And if we solve that, we get TAB equals minus RAY over sine theta. And let's just revisit why we have the signs that we have. I'm doing up minus down. So this is drawn upwards. So I'll treat it as upwards. Well, it actually is upwards because we got a positive value. So this is up and then if this bar is in tension, and we always start out by assuming that every bar is in tension, then it's pulling up and to the right on A, and it's pulling down and to the left on B. And in the next step, we'll see if bar AD is in tension, then it's pulling to the right on A, and it's pulling to the left on D. So we have plus RAY, because that's up, and we have plus TAB sine theta, because that vertical component is up. Then the forces in x, zero is the sum of the forces in the x direction, right minus left, acting on joint A. R, A, X. We know it actually is to the left, but we drew the arrow to the right and we wrote a negative number. So we can just take it as drawn with the arrow here. We'll say it's to the right. And then plus T, A, D, all of it. And then plus T, A, B, cosine theta. So that adds up to zero. There's only one unknown here, which is T, A, D. T, A, D is going to equal minus T, A, B, cosine theta minus R A X. Looking at our candidate answers, I think I like C, Charlie, for R A X plus T A D plus T A B cosine theta equals zero, and then R A Y plus T A B sine theta equals zero. Yeah, so I think I like C, Charlie. Now let's work out numbers. So plugging in numbers, we get TAB is minus 1.68 kilonewtons, which I rewrote up here, and TAD is plus two and a half kilonewtons, which I wrote over here. By the way, we'll see in a moment that TCD equals TAD is something we could expect because later when we write the equations for joint D, we'll see there are only two things horizontally here. So if you have only two horizontal forces, then at meeting at a joint, they must equal one another. Next, let's ask what the method of joints will let us write at joint D. This will be pretty interesting because everything happens at right angles, and it'll give us some good cross-checks on stuff we've already found. Forces acting on joint D. Zero is the sum of forces I think it doesn't matter whether we start with x or y in this case. Let's start with x, right minus left. So we have TCD pulling to the right, and we have TAD pulling to the left. See, so this tells us that TCD equals TAD, which we already knew, but it's a nice check. That makes sense because TCD pulls joint D to the right if it's in tension. TAD pulls joint D to the left, assuming that it's in tension and nothing else has a horizontal component. So this force to the right must balance this force to the left. So that's a neat check. So now we're going to see when we do the vertical forces that TBD simply equals this load here, two kilonewtons. And if this load were not here, then TBD would have to equal zero. Anytime you have a perpendicular and there's only one thing coming into the perpendicular, that bar force must be zero. Zero is the sum of the forces in the y direction. We'll do up minus down. So TBD would pull up, and then this two kilonewton load is downward. So if this is zero, that directly tells us TBD equals plus two kilonewtons. Okay, so TBD equals plus two kilonewtons. Then let's compare with our available answers. Minus TAD plus TCD equals zero. I think I like that. Yep. So I like C here, Charlie. And then minus two kilonewtons. I don't like that. 
Minus two kilonewtons plus TBD equals zero. I like that. Minus TAD plus TCD equals zero. I like that. So I think it's A, alpha. Minus two kilonewtons plus TBD equals zero. That seems to be what we wrote here. Minus TAD plus TCD equals zero. That also, that seems to be what we wrote here. Good, A, alpha. Let's compare what we just worked out with what I wrote down earlier. So earlier I got TAB is minus 1.68 kilonewtons, which matches what we just worked out. I wrote down TBC is minus 2.8 kilonewtons, which matches what we worked out. I wrote down TAD is plus 2.5 kilonewtons, which matches what we worked out. And TCD is plus 2.5 kilonewtons is what we just worked out, which agrees with what I worked out earlier. And TBD is plus 2 kilonewtons, which agrees with what we just worked out. I point out here, so I named each member force T for tension. It's kind of convenient. You're kind of used to cable tension. So, and then TIJ is bigger than zero for tension, and TIJ is smaller than zero for compression. And then often it makes sense after you've solved the truss to draw the arrows with the correct signs. So I'll do that on the next page. So if you want to go through and touch up the arrow directions, you see we could read. You see we could redraw the RAX arrow to the point to the left. So then you can say one kilonewton without the minus sign and it points to the left. And then bar AB turned out to be in compression. So you could draw those arrows the other way to indicate compression if you wanted to. And bar BC turned out to be in compression. So you can, if you want to, you can reverse the arrow so that it looks as if it's in compression instead of tension. It's kind of a style issue. I do think it makes sense to draw the reaction forces with arrows pointing the way that you actually worked out the answer. For the bars, I think the minus signs are okay if you get a negative answer. Anyway, all of this is a matter of style. As long as it's clear by looking at your diagram what the actual signs and directions of the forces really are. Another thing you can do, by the way, if you like, is you could just type all 2J equations at once and put them into Mathematica or Maple or Alpha or whatever your favorite computer algebra system is, and you get the answers out. So you could do that. I mean, sometimes I do that. I doubt many of you will have a preference for doing that, but I wanted you to see that it's possible. And by the way, if you want to learn how to use Mathematica for doing such things, maybe you're in a really quantitative field and it would be really useful, I actually have some study materials that I could let you go through for extra credit if you feel super eager to learn how to use Wolfram Mathematica, which, by the way, can be used license-free by all SAS and I think also Wharton students. So we actually solved our first trust. So we will go on now and solve another one. Here's another truss problem on slide 26. We have a truss with five joints, A, B, C, D, E, and it is simply supported. It has a hinge support on the left at joint A. It has a roller support on the right at joint D. There is one load, a vertical two kilonewton load at joint C downward. How many reaction forces are exerted by the supports? At joint A, this reaction on the left is a pin or hinge type support, so it can exert both horizontal and vertical forces. So there are two here. And then at joint D, this reaction is a roller support, so it can exert only a vertical force since it is rolling on a horizontal surface. So we get one vertical reaction force here, which I called RDY. We get a horizontal and vertical reaction forces here, which I call RAX and RAY. I think we can guess that RAX will turn out to be zero because there are no other external horizontal forces. And then I think we can anticipate that RAY and RDY will add up to two kilonewtons. And we can probably also anticipate that RDY will be bigger because this load is closer to D than it is to A. In fact, it seems likely, you see, if the load were right in the middle here at E, it would be one and one with a one to one ratio. I think we're gonna get a three to one ratio. So I think it's going to be one and a half here and one half here, but we'll see. 
We'll see. All the angles, by the way, are 60 degrees. We don't have any lengths marked, but all the lengths are equal. How many internal forces, in other words, tensions or compressions in the members, do we need to solve for to solve this truss? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It seems as if we have seven bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven bar forces to solve for, which I have labeled up here, T-A-B, T-A-E, T-B-C, T-B-E, T-C-E, T-D-E, T-C-D. So I've assumed they're all in tension and we will just get negative numbers if they actually are in compression. So we have seven unknown bar forces plus three unknown reactions. That's 10. And with five joints, we will get 10 equations. So that's good. That's exactly the right number of equations to solve for the number of unknowns that we have. Do you see any joint where there are two or fewer unknown forces. If so, we can start there and just work directly on the truss. Otherwise, we need to start with a EFBD, an extended free body diagram for the truss as a whole. Now, this statement is not strictly true even if you have you know, more than two unknown forces at a given joint. If you're willing to write down a big system of equations and solve the whole system of equations, you can just write down the two equations for each joint and you will get an answer. But it can be very tedious work solving a big system of equations. You really don't wanna work with more than one or two variables at a time. And that's why if there is no joint at which there are two or fewer unknowns, then in order to keep the calculations manageable, you would then go and solve for the reaction forces first before going back to work, write down the two equations for each joint. There are four unknowns at A. There are three unknowns at B. There are three unknowns at C. There are three unknowns at D, and there are four unknowns at E. So there actually is no joint where there are two or fewer unknowns. And we don't like having to work through a huge system of equations. So we need to start by drawing a free body diagram for the truss as a whole. We can do that just using this existing drawing as long as we make a mental note that we're only interested in the forces I wrote in light blue here. So the external forces. We have three external reaction forces and one external load force. All of these tension forces are internal forces, so they will not concern us right now. Let's try to guess RAX, RAY, and RDY by inspection. Then we'll check with the usual equation. So by inspection, I would say RAX is zero because there are no other horizontal forces. RAY and RDY have to add up to two kilonewtons. And RDY is three times closer to the load horizontally than our AY is. So I would say our DY is going to be three times as big as our AY and they add up to two kilonewtons. So I would say our DY will be one and a half kilonewtons and our AY will be one half. Let's see what we get from solving the equation. Let's start by summing the torques counterclockwise about point A. That way our AX and our AY will have zero lever arm and we won't have to worry about them right now. This will give us an equation that directly lets us solve for our DY. But let's just call the length of each bar L. So counterclockwise minus clockwise. This downward force at joint C is a clockwise rotation about pivot A. The upward force at joint D is a counterclockwise rotation about pivot A. R, D, Y is a vertical force, so we want a horizontal displacement, which is 2L. L will just drop out later. Then our two kilonewton load is one and a half units, three halves L away from the pivot horizontally. So vertical forces, we want horizontal displacement. That gives us R D Y equals two kilonewtons times three halves divided by two. So that's times three quarters. The L dropped out and we get one and a half kilonewtons equals R D Y, which was what we figured out by inspection. Then we can sum the forces vertically for the whole truss. So we'll do up minus down. So we have R A Y plus R D Y minus two kilonewtons equals zero. We want to solve for R A Y. R A Y is two kilonewtons minus R D Y. So that's two minus one and a half is one half. So R A Y is one half kilonewton. 
Then we can say zero is the sum of the forces in the x direction on the truss as a whole, and that's R A X. That's the only one, so R A X must equal zero since it is the only horizontal force. So we can just write that on our diagram: R A X equals zero. R A Y is a half kilonewton. R D Y is three halves kilonewton. Now we want to start from a joint having no more than two unknown forces, and it's actually even even easier if you can find equations to write down that have only one unknown. So that might mean a joint with only one unknown, or it might mean, for example, if we start at D, you see there's only one vertical force component that's unknown at D. So if we started at D, we could start with TCD, and then once we have that, it's easy for us to figure out TDE. So notice I annotated my diagram with the solved values for the reaction forces, and then also notice that I filled in little unknowns for all of the bar tensions. And I always assume they're tensions, so I can just write the letter capital T, and we'll get a negative number if it turns out to be a compression. One thing to really keep in mind when you're working on these truss problems is that if you make a mistake early on, that mistake can propagate through a lot of downstream results. So you really want to double or triple check your results as you go along when solving these truss problems. If you make a mistake early on, it can be very tedious to go back and fix it. I think when I solved this problem in the past, I just worked alphabetically, but I'm going to start at joint D. Let's try that. So starting at joint D, which means we're considering the forces acting on joint D. At joint D, forces acting on joint D. If we try to write the horizontal equations, we'll have two unknowns, TDE and TCD. Whereas if we do the vertical equation, we'll have TCD and this reaction force we already solved for. So let's start with the vertical equation. So we'll do up minus down acting on joint D. We have RDY is up, and then the vertical component of TCD is up because it is pulling joint D up and to the left. So this is plus TCD sine of 60 degrees equals zero. TCD equals minus RDY divided by sine 60 degrees. Sine of 60 degrees is root three over two. So the reciprocal of that would be two over root three. So I think we find that TCD is minus root three kilonewtons. The two cancels with the two, and then three divided by root three is root three. So I think root three is 1.732. So I think we should get minus 1.732 kilonewton. Let's write it over here. Now we can do the sum of the forces in X X acting on joint D. TDE is pulling joint D to the left, and TCD cosine 60 degrees is pulling joint D to the left. So we have minus TDE minus TCD cosine 60 degrees. Cosine 60 degrees is just one half. This gives us TDE equals minus TCD cosine 60 degrees, which is one half. So TDE equals plus root three over two kilonewtons. Root three over two is I think 0.866. So we can take this 0.866 and write it somewhere. We might as well write it here. Where should we go next? We can't really go to E because there are still three unknowns there. But if we go to C, now there are two unknowns at C. So we could go to C. So let's move over to joint C. At joint C, if we write the horizontal equation, we'll be dealing with two unknowns at once. If we write the vertical equation, we're dealing with only a single unknown, TCE. So let's start with the vertical equation. Vertical forces acting on joint C. We have minus TCD sine 60 degrees minus 2 kilonewtons minus TCE sine 60 degrees. This 2 kilonewton load is pushing down on C. TCD is pulling down and to the right on C. TCE is pulling down and to the left on C. So those are all minus signs. That gives us TCE equals minus two kilonewtons minus TCD sine 60 degrees divided by sine 60 degrees. TCE 
equals minus 2 kilonewtons divided by sine 60 degrees minus TCD, which is known. TCE equals minus 2 kilonewtons times 2 over root 3, because sine 60 degrees is root 3 over 2. And then TCD was negative root 3 kilonewtons, so subtracting that is adding root 3 kilonewtons. This actually is a nicer number than I originally realized. See, I recognize 0.577. So this is minus 4 over root 3, and then this is plus 3 over root 3. Root 3 is the same as 3 over root 3. So minus 4 over root 3 plus 3 over root 3 is minus 1 over root 3 kilonewtons. So that's minus 0.577. TCE equals minus 1 over root 3 kilonewtons, which is minus 0.577 kilonewtons, and we will write that here. My high school physics teacher, Mr. Rodriguez, had all of these cool numbers, like 1 over root 3 is 0.577 memorized because he grew up in the slide rule era. Let's write the horizontal equation for joint C, right minus left. We do have something to the right, which is TCD cosine theta. TCD cosine 60 degrees. That's pulling, see TCD is pulling down and to the right, and TCD, TCE is pulling down and to the left. It's minus TCE cosine 60 degrees, and then TBC is just pulling directly to the left on joint C. Minus TBC equals zero, and the only one that's unknown here is TBC. So we can solve directly TBC equals TCD minus TCE cosine 60 degrees, which is one half. Again, we want things acting on joint C horizontally. CD is down and to the right, so that's a plus sign with a cosine theta. CE is down and to the left, so that's a minus sign with a cosine theta. BC is just to the left. You see TBC is pulling joint C to the left. Later we'll see it's pulling joint B to the right. So this is one half minus root three minus minus one over root three kilonewtons which is one half minus three over root three plus one over root three kilonewtons, which is minus two over two root three kilonewtons, which is minus one over root three kilonewtons, which is minus 0.577 kilonewtons. So TBC is minus 0.577 kilonewtons. TBC equals minus 1 over root 3 kilonewtons equals minus 0.577 kilonewtons. Where should we go next? We want a place where there are no more than two unknown forces. So joint B should suffice because we have only TAB and TBE to solve for. And I think we're going to have two equations to deal with at the same time, no matter what we do, because both of these bars have both vertical and horizontal components. Now, if we went to joint A, we would have two unknowns, TAB and TAE. And if we do the vertical equation first for joint A, then we have only one variable to deal with. So let's do joint A and we'll start with the vertical equation. Forces acting on joint A starting with the vertical equation. So we have R A Y plus T A B sine 60 degrees. That's it equals zero. That gives us T A B equals minus R A Y divided by sine 60 degrees. Sine 60 degrees is root three over two. So the one half and the two will cancel. This is minus one over root three kilonewtons, which is minus 0.577 kilonewtons is T A B. T A B is minus one over root three kilonewtons is minus 0.577 kilonewtons. Now we can move on and staying at joint A, we can write the horizontal equations. Let's do that. Zero is the sum of the horizontal forces acting on joint A. So we have right minus left T 
A E is to the right. R A X, which we know is zero, but still it's acting to the right. And then we have plus T A B cosine 60 degrees. All that adds up to zero. So T A B cosine theta is to the right. It's pulling to the right and upward on A. T A E is pulling to the right on A and RAX is pushing to the right on A as drawn, though we know it turns out to be zero. That gives us TAE equals minus RAX minus TAB. Cosine 60 degrees is one half. TAB we found earlier was minus one over root three kilonewtons. So this must be plus one over two root three kilonewtons. Unlike Mr. Rodriguez, I couldn't tell you what this is. This number turns out to be 0.2887. TAE is plus one over two root three kilonewtons is plus 0.2887 kilonewtons. Now the one thing we're missing is TBE. So we could do that either at joint B or at joint E. Ah, if we look at joint E, we see that the vertical components, you see there are two vertical things and there's nothing else. So those two vertical things have to sum to zero their vertical components must be equal and opposite, and they're at the same angle, so therefore the, their magnitudes must be equal and opposite. So let's write that down. Let's, let's do the vertical equation for joint E. Joint E, vertical forces, we have plus TCE sine 60 degrees plus TBE sine 60 degrees equals zero. You see TCE is up and to the right, TBE is up and to the left when acting on joint E. That gives us TBE is just the opposite of TCE, so that must be plus one over root three kilonewtons. TBE is plus 0.577 kilonewtons. So now we've found every bar force and we found all three reaction forces. We have completely solved this truss. That was extremely tedious. So I wrote the numbers in on the truss here. If we go and look at my pre-drawn slide, you can see I did it in a slightly different way. First of all, if you really want to, you could look at all of my math. Then here is the drawing with everything assumed to be in tension and the results written down below. And then finally I redrew it so that if something is in compression, I drew the arrows pushing outward. If it's in tension, I drew the arrows pulling inward. Oh, and look at this. I even made the little slashes through the arrows. Aha. Uh -huh. I usually don't do that. Let me try that. So I'll make the little slashes here indicating that they're reaction forces. Okay, so this is the solution for this truss, which matches what we just wrote on the light board. Let's use this very same truss as a segue from the method of joints into the method of sections. The method of sections is conceptually a little harder to understand, but if you're only looking for a subset of the bar forces rather than every single bar force, the method of sections is much, much less work, much, much less tedious. And if you are trying to get to a bar force that's well away, you kind of would have to work your way through many equations to get to it with the method of joints. The method of sections can sort of be a shortcut that takes you directly to the bar forces of interest. So let's see how that works using this already solved truss as an example. So suppose we want to solve for at most three unknown bar forces, let's say we pick T, B, C, T, C, E, T, D, E. The trick is you have to be able to draw a cut line. So we call this a section. We are sectioning the truss. So we draw a cut line which passes through at most three unknown bar forces. So you can't have more than three unknown bar forces that the cut passes through. And you'll see why that's true in a minute. And then you draw an extended free body diagram for just one half, one side of the cut. And all these things that you chopped in half, now you are treating them as external forces acting on the side that you're keeping. So you kind of erase one side and you redraw the other side 
And now these bar forces that you cut through, you treat as external forces rather than as internal forces. And it really helps a lot until you get really good at this. You have to redraw the diagram. Otherwise, you'll be infinitely confused about which forces point which way, and you'll have minus sign errors all over the place. So let's try this carefully. We are going to draw an extended free body diagram for the right side of the cut, the right side of the section. And we are sectioning the truss like this. So here we go. So I will draw. Here is joint C. Here's joint D. And we've cut this. And I'm going to draw it as a tension. So this is T, D, E. And you see it's pulling this way on what's left. So it's really important to get that arrow the right direction. And then here is T, C, E. And you see it's pulling this way on what's left on the right hand side. And here is T, B, C. And it's pulling to the left on what is remaining. And then we have to make sure we do not forget to write this load, 2 kilonewtons. And let's make sure not to forget to draw this reaction force, which was 1.5 kilonewtons. So that is it. Those are all of the external forces on that piece that we did not erase. So you see TBC is pulling to the left on joint C, and joint C is part of what remains. So we have to draw that arrow to the left. And TCE is pulling down and to the left on joint C, and joint C is part of what remains. So that's the direction we draw that force. Okay. Now, this seems like fun. Now we use the three equations for static equilibrium in the plane to solve for these three unknown forces, and we should get the same answers we got before. But you see, now we don't have to spend, you know, pages of algebra solving for every single force in the truss. We can just go directly to these three. And now you see why you can't pick more than three. We're going to use the three equations for static equilibrium in a plane. We only get three equations, so we can only have three unknowns. These three bars that we cut have unknown forces. So we're not allowed to have more than three unknowns if we're going to use the equations for statics in a plane to solve the problem. So basically what we did is we drew this section, and then we erased everything on the left of the section, and then we have to draw the arrows in the directions that will get us the answers with the correct signs. So, okay, we're going to say on what's left here, we're going to do the three equations for static equilibrium. Ah, now, you see, this is very interesting. If we pivot about joint C, then we can get an equation that involves only one unknown. And in fact, if you wanted to solve for just bar force DE and nothing else, then this is the trick. You use the method of sections, and then you choose a clever pivot so that you eliminate all but that force. So let's use, let's pivot. Zero is the sum counterclockwise about joint C of the torques, or moments, as Professor Farley would say. This is going to be interesting. So about joint C, it's actually a little bit tricky to see which way this goes. About joint C, so if we hold our finger on joint C, then the one and a half kilonewton reaction going upward is going to be counterclockwise, and TDE is going to be clockwise, okay? So holding point C constant, TDE to the left will be a clockwise motion, that's a minus sign, and then this reaction force at joint D vertically upward will be counterclockwise, so that's a plus sign. So let's write that down. 1.5 kilonewtons. Now, what is the lever arm? That's a vertical force. We want the horizontal displacement. The vertical force, horizontal displacement to point C is a half of the length of a bar. So this L is half, this L is the length of a bar. L over 2 is half the length of a bar. And now minus TDE times, oh, now what is this distance? So it's a horizontal force. We want the vertical distance. This must be L times the sine of 60 degrees, L times the cosine of 30 degrees, L times the sine of 60 degrees. The sine of 60 degrees is root 3 over 2. The L will cancel out. This gives us TDE equals 3 halves times 1 half times 2 over root 3 kilonewtons. TDE equals, well, one of these twos cancels with this one. And then this root 3 could turn this into 
a root 3 on top. So this must be root 3 over 2 kilonewtons, which is 0.866 kilonewtons with a plus sign. So we get TDE is plus root 3 over 2 kilonewtons, which is plus 0.866 kilonewtons. Let's see if that's what we got before. TDE we got before was plus root 3 over 2 kilonewtons plus 0.866 kilonewtons. So we got the same answer, but without all the tedious work. But it seems to require quite a bit more cleverness to write this down correctly. Okay. Let's see what sum of forces in y gives us. You see, sum of forces in x would relate this known thing and these two so far unknown things. So if we do sum of forces in y, or relate this one unknown thing, TCE, to everything else which is known. So let's do the sum of the forces in y next. Here we go. Zero is the sum of the forces in y on that whole thing that's left, which is, we'll do up minus down, we have one, okay, three halves kilonewtons, and then we have minus two kilonewtons. Three halves kilonewtons is this reaction down here. Two kilonewtons is this load up here. And then we have minus TCE sine 60 degrees. Minus because it's this is down and to the left, so the Y component is negative. So this tells us that TCE equals, this would go to the other side of the equation, minus one half kilonewton divided by sine 60 degrees. You see this is three halves minus two is minus a half. Okay, and then sine 60 degrees is root three over two. So this is minus a half kilonewton times two over root three. So this is minus one over root three kilonewtons, which is minus 0.577 kilonewtons is TCE. And what we got before is the same thing. TCE is minus 0.577 kilonewtons. So we're able to get the same result we got before, but quite a bit more directly this way. Now finally let's see what the horizontal equation for the part that we did not erase tells us. Uh, so we have minus TBC minus TCE cosine 60 degrees minus TDE equals zero. So on this stuff here horizontal forces minus TBC minus TCE cosine 60 degrees minus TDE. So they're all to the left as drawn. And the only thing left to solve for is TBC. So TBC is minus TDE minus TCE cosine 60 degrees is a half. So TBC is, so TDE was plus root three over two. So this is minus root three over two. And then TCE was minus one over root three. So with a minus sign it would be plus. So that's plus one over two root three kilonewtons. And this is TBC is. Okay, so this is minus three over root two, minus one over two root three kilonewtons. We can factor out the one half. So there's minus, and then we have root three. Root three is the same thing as three over root three. So we have minus three over root three, and then plus one over root three. So this is minus three plus one. So this is one half, this is minus two over root three. So twos cancel. So we have minus one over root three kilonewtons, which is minus 0.577 kilonewtons for TBC. And that is what we got before for TBC. Okay, so that is our first attempt at the method of sections. Just for practice, now let's go back and we'll erase the right half and we'll solve for the same three forces from the other side. So you'll see what happens if we were to, if we had kept the same section, but instead of erasing the left and keeping the right, instead we will erase the right and keep the left. Let's see how that goes. So we'll keep this same section line, but now we will erase the right side and draw a free body diagram for what remains. And we should get something that looks like this. So here we go. Let's erase what's to the right of the section line. Now this, this, and this point this way because TBC is pulling to the right on B, TCE is pulling up and to the right on E, TDE is pulling to the right on E. So when we write, we want to write a free body diagram for what remains here. You see, so these forces that we cut 
are now considered to be external forces, the bar forces that we cut. You have to get the directions right. So you see, this is what direction is it pulling on what remains after we did our erasing. This is pulling to the right on what remains. This is pulling up and to the right on what remains. This is pulling to the right on what remains. And then we can't leave out the other external forces. So the reaction forces are also external forces. We usually start with a carefully chosen torque equation. Yeah, if we pivot about E, then we can get an equation that only gives us TBC. So let's try that. So zero is the sum counterclockwise about E of the torques. So then TCE and TDE will both have zero lever arm since they pass through the pivot. So we'll just get something involving TBC and things that we know. If we put one hand on point E and then we move the other hand in the direction that TBC is trying to move us, that is going clockwise about point E. So this TBC term will have a minus sign. Minus TBC. That's a horizontal force. We want the vertical distance. The vertical distance is L sine 60 degrees, which is L root 3 over 2. Now what's left? We have about point E. Okay, so actually this reaction force in X, even if we didn't know it was zero, it would have zero lever arm because its line of action passes through our pivot. So that's zero. RAY, so our pivot here at E, so RAY would be clockwise about our pivot. So that's also with a minus sign. So this is minus RAY times L. It's a vertical force. The horizontal distance between RAY's line of action and the pivot is L, the length of one bar. So this tells us that TBC, this stuff adds up to zero. This tells us that TBC equals minus RAY divided by sine 60 degrees. This is minus RAY y times 2 over root 3. And what was R A Y? R A Y was a half kilonewton. TBC is minus 1 half kilonewton times 2 over root 3. This is minus 1 over root 3 kilonewtons. So TBC is minus 0.577 kilonewtons. Let's see if that agrees with what we got by conventional methods before. TBC minus 1 over root 3 kilonewtons minus 0.577 kilonewtons. Okay, cool. Now we can write the sum of the forces vertically on what's drawn here, and that will give us TCE in terms of things we already know. So let's write zero is the sum of vertical forces acting on what we didn't erase. So we have RAY with a plus sign because it's up. And then we have TCE sine 60 degrees and it's also up because it's up and to the right plus TCE sine 60 degrees. I think that's it. Yeah, so reaction force. Reaction force is horizontal. These are both horizontal. Yep. So that gives us TCE equals minus R A Y over sine 60 degrees, which is minus one half kilonewtons. And then sine 60 degrees is root three over two. So this is two over root three. So this is minus one over root three. Kilonewtons is minus 0.577. Kilonewtons is TCE. And that agrees with what we got in the past. So that's good. So let's now sum the forces horizontally on what's left. And we get RAX to the right. And we have TDE to the right. And we have TBC to the right. And we have part of TCE to the right, TCE cosine 60 degrees. So all that stuff adds up to zero. The one we're trying to solve for is TDE. So TDE equals minus RAX, which we know is zero, plus TBC plus TCE cosine of 60 degrees is a half. So this is minus zero minus one over root three. So that's plus one over root three kilonewtons. And then TCE 
is minus 1 over root 3. So this is plus 1 over 2 root 3 kilonewtons. So this is 2 over 2 root 3 plus 1 over 2 root 3. This is 3 over 3, 3 over 2 root 3 kilonewtons equals root 3 over 2 kilonewtons, which is 0.866 kilonewtons, TDE. And that is what we got before. So that's good. So that's our first example of the method of sections. The method of sections is a little bit tricky to wrap your mind around at first, but it's worth doing because when we later study beams, the method of sections is how we will figure out what's happening in the middle of a beam. What force and what torque does the left side of the beam have to exert on the right side of the beam to hold it up, for example? Here's another truss problem that we can solve using the method of sections. So we wanna find the forces in members CE, CF, and DF, and actually we've assumed that they're all in tension. So if they're not in tension, then we will get negative numbers. So to find those three forces, we want to section the truss in a way that passes through those three members. And then we have to decide whether it is going to be easier to analyze the left side or the right side of the cut. So let's think about that. Oh, by the way, Richard Farley pointed out to me in the past, and I just noticed now as I was thinking about the reaction forces, that there's a missing member in the original drawing of the truss. So on the slide, there really has to be a member here because if there weren't a member here, there could be only a horizontal force here, not a vertical force, and only a horizontal force here, not a vertical force. But then there would be no way for the wall to take the vertical load. So somehow the wall has to be able to exert a vertical force as well as a horizontal force at at least one of these two points. Well, at exactly one of these two points. So you need either this diagonal or this diagonal, take your pick. The place where we should section this truss if we want to find TCE, TCF, and TDF is right through those three bar forces. So we wanna draw our section line right here or on this version that is right here. And now you have to think, well, is it going to be easier to analyze the right side or the left side? You might say, well, the left side looks smaller, maybe it's more manageable, but let's start filling in some details on the left side. I think you'll be persuaded that the right side is likely to be easier to analyze. So if we erase these supports and replace them with indications of the reaction forces. So the wall must exert a force. We can call this, let's call this B sub X, and let's call this A sub Y, and I'm gonna draw it this way because my intuition says I think it should go this way. Let's call this A sub X. The reactions exerted by the wall on the truss. In fact, I can then put little slash marks through them so that you know that they're not loads, they're reactions. So we don't know any of these three reaction forces. So we would have to do statics for the truss as a whole to solve for these three reaction forces before we can then start analyzing the left side. But if it, we instead erase the left side and analyze the right side, we can start going without first finding these reaction forces. So let's do that. Let's, anal let's erase the left side and analyze the right side. We could do another tricky thing, by the way. Even after we erase the left side, we can still pivot about point C if we wanna solve for, for bar force TDF. That's a little bit tricky. So here, we'll erase the left side everything left of the section, but I will continue to indicate where point C is. Okay, so to the left of our section, and parts, point C is not part of our section. I'm just leaving it there because I wanna show you a trick. We could, if we wanted to find just bar force DF, we could pivot about point C, even though point C is no longer part of the section that we are analyzing. I mean, you can pivot about any point you like, and this happens to be a point that these two forces pass through. TDF, assuming that this bar is in tension, pulls this right-hand side of the truss to the left. TCF pulls this right-hand side of the truss up and to the left. TCE pulls this right-hand part of the truss to the left. So if we pivot about point C, then we can immediately write an equation involving only TDF. Let's do that. Zero 
equals the sum counterclockwise about C of the torque anchoring this point C. Okay, these have zero lever arm because they pass through that point. Their lines of action pass through C. So TDF would be, see going this way, we're going clockwise about C. So this has a minus sign. Minus TDF times one meter. I mean, these are all 45 degree angles. All the horizontal or vertical bars are the same length. So we don't really even need to know the length because the length will cancel out. But, but there it is, we put in some length. Now, about C, this one kilonewton force, this is also clockwise. Everything is going to be clockwise. I think that tells you that TDF will wind up being negative. So this is one, two, three units to the right. Minus one kilonewton, three meters. Minus two kilonewtons, one, two, three, four units to the right. Vertical force wants the horizontal displacement. So that gives you TDF equals, well here's three times one, and two times four, that's three, and eight is 11, minus 11 kilonewtons. So that was pretty direct. TDF, so it's actually in compression. TDF equals minus 11 kilonewtons. And if you remember the diving board problem from Giancoli chapter nine, remember for a cantilever diving board, the bottom surface is in compression, the top surface is in tension, so I think it makes sense that this bar on the bottom of the truss is in compression. I'll bet we'll find that this is in tension. I can show you another rarely used trick. You can, if you want to, use a second pivot equation. So let's do zero is the sum counterclockwise about point F of the torques. So if we pivot about point F, then we'll get an equation that gives us TCE quite directly. So let's do that. So this is not a trick you'll use very often, but here it is. So about point F, TCE is counterclockwise, but these two loads are clockwise. If I keep this pivot fixed. That's clockwise, that's clockwise, that's counterclockwise. So we have TCE times one unit. This is a horizontal force with a vertical offset, so that's just one meter. And then minus one kilonewton. From point F, it's one, two units. And then minus two kilonewtons. And this is one, two, three units. So TCE equals two plus six is kilonewtons. And it is indeed in tension. TCE is plus kilonewtons. And then we can use the sum of the forces. Well, if we did it vertically, we would include both of these. And if we do it horizontally, we'll include both of these. I guess we can do it, yeah, let's just do it vertically. So then we'll get TCF times sine of 45 degrees equals three kilonewton. So that seems straightforward. So we'll do sum of the forces in Y add to zero. This is on the whole thing we've drawn. External forces, so these loads are external forces. If there were any reactions that we had not erased, they would be external forces. And the bars that we cut are external forces. So we have, this is up minus down, plus TCF sine 45 degrees minus, and there's one plus two, three kilonewtons. So that gives us TCF equals three kilonewtons divided by sine 45. Sine 45 is one over root two. So this is three kilonewtons times the square root of two. So TCF is plus three root two kilonewtons. So that's a, what, a little more than four, like four, four and a half. So plus 4.24 kilonewtons. So that gave us TDF is minus 11 kilonewtons. So it is in compression. TCE is plus eight kilonewtons. So it is in tension. It's not surprising to have tension on the top and compression on the bottom for a cantilever. And TCF is three root two kilonewtons, which is about four and a quarter, 4.24 kilonewtons. Comparing with what I wrote earlier in my slide, you see we have the force arrows drawn the same way and we reach the same conclusion about TDF being 
11 kilonewtons in compression, TCE being 8 kilonewtons in tension, and TCF being 3 root 2 kilonewtons in tension. For what it's worth, here's some pre-computed algebra. And notice that in the pre-computed algebra that I worked out for class last time, I just used the standard method of one pivot and sum of forces in X and sum of forces in Y. And in fact, I use F for the pivot. I don't do the tricky thing of using C for the pivot. So the way I worked it out just now on the board is different from the way I worked it out in the notes I wrote down. Here's a really tricky statics problem. This is actually not at all a truss problem, even though it has a truss drawn on it. It's just a statics problem. An inclined king post truss. I don't know what a king post truss is. We should ask Professor Farley to tell us what the phrase king post truss means. An inclined king post truss supports a vertical and horizontal force at C. Determine the support reactions developed at A and B. So this is not really a truss problem because we're not asked to solve for the internal forces in the truss. But it is an example of a pretty tricky equilibrium problem. So let's try working through it together. It actually is deviously tricky. Uh, by the way, so you can notice from the given dimensions that the angle of the incline is the same as the interior angle at joints A and B of the truss. And then you can also notice that there is a pin support at A and there is a roller support at B. Although again, in a kind of deviously tricky way, the roller support at B is at this funny angle of a 5 twelfths pitch slope. So let's see what we can do. And again, the, the whole problem is just to determine the three reaction forces. So the horizontal and vertical reaction forces at A, and then the, the single, uh, you know, diagonal reaction force at B, which is perpendicular to that 5 twelfths surface. Here's my redrawn version of the truss. I think the first thing we want to do is get the magnitude of RB by pivoting about A. So if we write torques about A, then we can get this force RB, I think pretty directly, except that it's going to be tricky to figure out the lever arms for these horizontal and vertical forces. So when we pivot about point A, this force, this reaction force at B, will be a counterclockwise, therefore positive torque, and it will just be RB times this distance, because this is perpendicular to this. And I guess this is 6 meters, this is 6 meters, so this will just be 12 meters times RB with a plus sign. So I think that's easy. Then we have this clockwise, therefore negative torque from the horizontal one kilonewton force. So we have to figure out what this vertical distance is. That might be tricky. Well, then we have this vertical load. So for the vertical load, we'll have to figure out what this horizontal distance is. And again, that also might be tricky. So let's try that. So we'll pivot about A, zero equals the sum counterclockwise about A of the torque. So here is a counterclockwise torque. We have the reaction force at B times 6 plus 6 is 12 meters. And then minus, now we have the horizontal one kilonewton. So we need a vertical distance for this. And then we have the vertical one kilonewton and we need a horizontal distance for that. So for this horizontal force, we need this vertical lever arm. And for this vertical force, we need this horizontal lever arm. And actually, it seems like if you really put on your thinking cap, this angle from the horizontal up to this diagonal is 2 theta. So I think, do we know this length? This is a 5, 12, 13 triangle. This is 1 half of 5 is 2 and a half. This is 1 half of 12 is 6. And this is 1 half of 13 is 6 and a half. So 5, 12, 13 are values that make a right triangle. So 12 squared plus 5 squared is 13 squared. You see 144 and 25 is 169. So 5, 12 squared plus 5 squared is 13 squared. That is a right triangle. 
And we actually have 13 over 2, 5 over 2, and 12 over 2 on this deviously tricky diagram. So this is the angle theta. So theta is arctan of 5 over 12. So I think this horizontal lever arm going with the vertical 1 kilonewton load must be 6.5 meters times cosine of 2 theta. And I think this vertical lever arm going with the horizontal 1 kilonewton force must be 6.5 meters sine of 2 theta, where 2 theta is 45.24 degrees. Because theta is arctan of 5 twelfths, which is about 22.62 degrees, and then 2 theta is just twice that. And you can see that in the drawing, this kind of looks like pretty close to a 45 degree angle. So this six and a half meters times sine of two theta is 4.615 meters. So that's the vertical lever arm that would go with this horizontal load. And then this horizontal lever arm is six and a half meters times cosine of two theta. Six and a half meters is the hypotenuse times cosine of two theta is the angle from the hypotenuse down to the horizontal. That's 4.577 meters, which would be the horizontal lever arm to go with this vertical load. So then we can substitute that and immediately get that RB, that's this reaction force this way, RB is 1 12th, because we're going to divide by this 12 meters, of 4.615 plus 4.577 kilonewtons. And then adding up the numbers, we get 0 0.7660 kilonewtons for Rb. Then we need one way or another to find these two reaction forces at point A. So I think we can get the two reaction forces at A just by summing the forces vertically and summing the forces horizontally. We will have to take this reaction at B and break it into vertical and horizontal components. To do that, it helps to notice that this angle of the reaction at B with respect to vertical is the same angle theta around 22.6 degrees as this. You see, because this main this slope that everything rests on is 22.6 degrees above the horizontal. This reaction at B is perpendicular to that slope, so it is 22.6 degrees away from the vertical. So I think we can say zero is the sum of the forces in X on the whole truss. So we'll do right minus left. So we have R A X to the right, and then we have the one kilonewton up here to the right, and then we have this small component of Rb, so this is minus Rb sine theta. So the horizontal part is sine theta since theta is measured from the vertical rather than from the horizontal. So I think that should give us directly Rax equals Rb sine theta minus 1 kilonewton. So this is R, we already solved for RB, and sine theta is 5 over 13, and then minus 1 kilonewton. So we'll plug in in a minute for that. And then meanwhile, meanwhile we can say 0 is the sum of the forces in Y, up minus down. So we have RAY, and then we have plus RB, cosine theta, and then minus one kilonewton from this vertical load. So that, and this all adds up to zero. So that gives you RAY equals one kilonewton minus RB, and then cosine theta is actually 12 13. So then we can plug in numbers for that. So just plugging in numbers, we get RAX is minus 0.7054 kilonewtons. So that tells you that this reaction force actually is to the left, and it's 0.7054 kilonewtons. And then RAY is plus 0.2929 kilonewtons, so it is up and has magnitude 0.2929. So you could say, why are we solving all these problems? And I think 
first of all, if you are a budding architect, then you will solve similar problems again when you take a structures course. So I think you always learn something more deeply if you see it more than once than if you see it only once. So I think this will, this will help because I think then the second time you see it, it will stick even more fully. And whether or not you're an architecture student, I think part of the point of taking a physics course is to exercise that kind of mathematical part of your brain. So this is good practice using torque. It's good practice decomposing vectors. It's good practice using trigonometry. And then finally, I think in the future, when you look at a railroad bridge or you look at the trusses that hold up a roof of a house, or later on when you look at a cantilever. I hope that some of the numbers we work out during the course will give you some insight into how things are held up in real life. So then finally we can compare these results with what I worked out in the past on my slides. It seems as if the numbers are the same. We got the reaction force at B which points perpendicular to the slope of the incline has a magnitude 0.7660 kilonewtons and then we got the horizontal reaction force at A is actually to the left and is 0.7054 kilonewtons and the vertical reaction at A points upward and is and is 0.2929 kilonewtons. And then here is a diagram annotated with the actual forces that we worked out. Here's the same diagram with that reaction force at B decomposed into components, horizontal and vertical. So that's what I have on trusses. This will take us a little while to digest in class, and there will be a little bit of reading from Onuye and Kane. Really, it will be skimming, so that you can see their diagrams, which are oh so much better than my diagrams. And they, I think they really are worth kind of imprinting on your visual brain. And then we can have a brief discussion of beams, which is sort of interesting because you can then understand a few things about why an I-beam has the eye-like shape that it has, and you can understand why floor joists are placed upright and not flat like planks. So we'll see how the dimensions of a beam relate to both the size of the space that it spans and the load that it can bear, which I think will give you some insights if you look around the basement of a house, for example, and ask yourself why the joists that hold up the first floor have the dimensions that they have.